Good afternoon. Hope you're good. Welcome back to Tune It Over. I'm Jim Chu, 12.30 till 1 o'clock weekdays. And we had a show off yesterday, purely because I had a cracking show planned for you, which I'm looking forward to delivering tomorrow instead, about value. Funnily enough, something that I talk about often with my friend Rob Bevan, who's joining me today to talk about something very different, kind of get into the clinical and policy stuff with regards to interprofessional identity, especially around chiropractic. But yesterday, I purely just had like a browser fail. I was cutting it a bit fine, but admittedly, Firefox and Chrome and stuff just wasn't behaving itself. And so I'm sorry we weren't on air yesterday. Uh, you know, instead, treated it like a DNA and do what everyone does when you get a DNA. And I made myself a brew, which I've not had a chance to for a while because it's been so hectic with all things Therapy Live, which is what I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit with Rob. Um, but we've been really keen to, to have this chat with Rob in part, in part because we've been getting his heads together about Therapy Live, getting the, the sort of interprofessional diversity across the streams and talking to Rob, who is a carol by background, which we sometimes forget um uh, about about how to do that and so it just seems smart for us to 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 get on air and talk a little bit about you know the position of chiropractic within the wider msk and healthcare settings always really keen for your opinion on this stuff and so please do join us and, and chew it over with us as to where you see that and so i want to ask you if you're tuning in live directly and early what's your take on the chiropractic profession be that currently or historically or whatever it might be just don't be shy i know that uh, uh, Rob's certainly got plenty of a, a thick skin and and, uh, and we want to hear your warts and all analysis as to how you see it and, and how you see them as a profession and them as, as, as professionals um, embedded within our, our wider project of raising MSK standards. Rob is my co-host on the Therapy Business Matters podcast and so hopefully it should be a pretty smooth little co-hosting session today, um, which I'm really looking forward to. So hopefully, Rob, can you hear me all right? I can hear you well, mate. Can you hear me all right? I can indeed. Yes, absolutely. Now, to some degree, me and you have many an off-air chat about all sorts of things. And I think this is one of the things that we talked about for almost first when we first met. But I don't think we've necessarily got so much into the weeds on it. And I feel like there's some things that I do really want to elicit from you and to try to understand better myself. So it comes from a very genuine place. But yeah. um, it kind of the context is that we've been speaking recently about trying to and pick your brain as to who you feel are the leading lights within your profession and and in doing so a lot of your answers end up being well these are folk that think like us in that they probably don't necessarily identify that strongly with this they identify more with a stronger uh, with a with a an evidence base or a style of practice more than they do a, a sort of professional identity however it's yeah. still something that does loom large sometimes because the reputation of chiropractic and the reputation of all all the individual msk professions sometimes does matter so i just wanted to throw it to you if i can to to give your take on where you feel caro sits now and how that differs from maybe where you want it to where it sits now, I think, is is still a uh, an MSK specialist profession. Um, and I think the way that I see it and the way I see it moving forward, which might not necessarily be how I practice personally, but how I think the profession as a whole kind of practices, is as an MSK spinal expert. And that's the, the way that we're taught and that's the way that it kind of comes across. And I think that is portrayed more so by the public as well. You know, if you ask... You know, 100 people on the street, what does a chiropractor do? Or what does a chiropractor treat? You know, I think the vast majority probably say back and neck pain. And I think that that's one thing that the chiropractic profession has done very well is they've done very well for advocating for evidence based quality management of, you know, spinal spinal pain, which, you know, you know, as well as I do, which is, you know, the leading you know MSK disability in the world. Um, I think that's what the chiropractors have done very well for the public. What I think they've done worse or they've done more or poorly is advertising that across the other healthcare professionals and i think that's where there's they've been a there's been a falling down of promoting of that evidence-based management around spinal pain to the gps and to the you know the you know spinal surgeon whatever it might be you know that's where i think there needs to be some improvement kind of moving forwards mm. and so because the, the, there is um a relevant distinction between it is an MSK healthcare profession and an MSK complementary sort of um, therapy, I guess. And yeah. those things, of course, can coexist, but it's just that, you know, uh, what what is it that differentiates that, I suppose, would be the application of the evidence, wouldn't it? It would be that, that 
to some degree. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, admitting my biases that you know I have no problem with the existence of medical acupuncturists and and astrologers on street corners. You know, it's like you know, if yeah. people pay your money, take your choice. It becomes slightly different on the public purse, of course. So we could talk yeah. about that, but but generally, it's more that though the existence of those is 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 kind of something I, I can easily make peace with. It's the yeah. notion that that is credible healthcare, and then to some degree, yeah, I think I I, I meet. Caros and hear of stories of the profession whereby chiropractic care can sit sometimes comfortably in either of those camps. And I wondered as to where, obviously, you're on record of being one that wants it to be nested within healthcare rather than complementary mm. uh, therapies. But it's not necessarily, I, I don't know, would you say that that's, that's everyone, that's the majority? Is that, is that a comfortable position? I think, I mean, there, there was a study, I think it was in 2019, that kind of looked at the views of chiropractic across the chiropractic profession. And there's, I think, 3.8K, nearly 4,000 or so chiropractors in the UK. And I think the the research said at that point, about 20% kind of had non, uh, I've forgotten how they phrased it, something like non-traditional traditional be beliefs kind of when it came to healthcare. And that's the kind of, I guess you call them alternative beliefs or beliefs that kind of didn't sit alongside the mainstream kind of status quo right. but then when you actually extrapolated that kind of 20 percent, because 20 percent sounds like quite a lot you know kind of one in five with kind of a belief you know that those type of beliefs when you extrapolated that that is a spectrum and when you kind of extrapolate the data to look at the numbers you're looking at about kind of 70 or so chiropractors with these kind of extreme you know kind of at odds with kind of the medics you know if you call the medics you know the other side of the spectrum um at odds with kind of mainstream yeah healthcare policy um about 70 or so people that's kind of what it came out as um but no i agree that there is that split and there is that divide and you know arguably that's the same with every profession as well you know if you you know i i, I send a colleague to go and you know i'll send a family member to go and see a physio an osteo a chiro i really don't know what they're going to get you know there's no way of knowing they might get 12 sessions of ultrasound they might get 12 sessions of manipulation or they might get 12 sessions of you know cranial realignment you know you don't know and that there is that divide between every you know every you know credible healthcare practitioner so that is a there's always that dichotomy there with within every every profession yeah absolutely and, and that's the interesting thing about the fact that you've got the professionals themselves having differences of opinion and there being sometimes a healthy broad church of opinion within any of those but then it's also for me my question definitely is leaning on as an identity within chiropractic like what are the schools of thought within different organizations or different training schools etc that then mean that sometimes those ideas aren't just kooky quirks of a niche corner of professionals that could have qualified many years ago etc or it, w how does it sit necessarily as a profession now with regards to what would be considered academic consensus or the being the yeah. the the uh, and, and and also you know the the what would be the mean average as to what someone would expect when seeing any given chiropractor yeah i mean the uh, as far as i'm aware in, in the uk and i can't speak for other countries i don't know enough about kind of the training and the, the stuff in the other countries in the uk all of the schools that we have teach that strong evidence-based msk foundation and that's kind of you know where we everyone comes out with that msk foundation um where people get these alternative beliefs you know i, I couldn't say kind of speak to individuals it comes from you know their uh, their own historical background their own historical historical biases they may have come to to school you know from a different country their own chiropractor they may have grown up seeing might have these alternative beliefs who they've then gone and gone to work for kind of later on down the line um but i think you know as far as the the, the vast majority of the profession these are the outliers and these are the people who you know the, the people which you know i interact with on a daily basis and of course that's i, I obviously sit in my own echo chamber to an extent when I, mm. when i'm talking about this you know the people i interact with but i also sit in the fringes of all of you know the whole profession you know there is that you know split you know if, if i call it that but it is the smaller niche and the, the majority of chiropractors will go against that and they will call out this nonsense behavior that can be peddled by you know mm. few and far between people so we've talked a lot about the fact that there's such similarities between mine and your styles of practice as far as we can imagine you know and, and neither of us have had any reason to bullshit each other so we can sort of trust the fact that the, the style of practice you know the the, the the very compatible you know if we happen to exist yeah. within the same facility and stuff and and we even talk about business practices and stuff and that's why we work together across various different projects now but i just wondered 
if you if I had to force you on the fact that do you think that your style of practice is something that is mainstream or novel relative to chiropractors? Um, personally, um, I think my style of practice is away from the average chiropractor um, in the way that I, my own style, my own personal practice, um, as with anyone who's in practice, I think it evolves depending on your own patient base. And I quite quickly became known as not a traditional chiropractor kind of within my own you know, within my own town within my own clinic and i think then that led to me seeing far more extra we call it extra spinal things you know and so my day i see more non-spinal stuff than i do spinal stuff whereas i think many uh you know chiropractors will see spine and neck as their staple and their kind of foundation and their rely their economic reliance will be on back and neck pain kind of every day so I think that's where I would differ I think how I would approach a lot of those patients would be quite different I don't have a huge bias on manipulation um well I think about 70 percent of the chiropractic profession will have a bias towards um manual therapy and manipulation being one of those kind of manual therapy tools mm -hmm. that's not really my bias it's not my it's a tool I might use and it's a tool I might use alongside in many other different types of manual therapy but it's not going to be my yeah kind of go to right. this is what I must do you know it's not mm. In, in my eyes, chiropractic is a it's a profession, you know, and a profession has beliefs and kind of that it stands on. But, you know, it's not, you know, identified purely based on those beliefs or those ideals. Yeah, it makes sense. I think what what would be your your reading of the evidence base is one of the things that has also shaped your style of practice. And so I suppose yeah. one of the reasons and what my what my question sort of nested in, I guess, is this notion that if then. A reading of the evidence base leads me as a physiotherapist to practice a certain way and you as a chiropractor to practice a certain way then it's somewhat that it's guided by us then caring about mechanism of effect caring about intervention based trial research caring about philosophy enough between the two of us to sort of have applied a model that seemed to be pragmatic application of what are the knowns in this current universe as much as we know them that for me is a convergence based on something that it's not like me and you have known each other for years and then persuaded each other in a certain way it's it's an yeah. interesting yeah there's some personality dispositions that you could suggest that both of us sort of fairly comfortable verbally in such a way that you can imagine that we're not going to necessarily try and use our hands to communicate compared you know compared to someone who, who struggles more with that um but that's for me why i find it interesting if you're why would you therefore be an outlier within chiropractic in terms of your style of practice if if the profession had moved as much as you do earlier described it um that's a really good question um you know we you and i've kind of reached the same what you kind of say you and i've reached the same end point kind of where we are in our careers but we started at different points mm. is that kind of where you are and i think that that is the way that everyone is going um and you know with the with the evidence that it is and i think social media has got a lot to do with this um the kind of the there's a lot of fantastic social media accounts which are pushing really good evidence-based management and that has opened up i think a lot of people's opinions a lot of mindsets and the conversations i'm having now with my colleagues with my friends is much more around that and is much more around you know when i graduated 10 years ago did i graduate 10 years ago 2011 2012 something like that um you know it was very much you know adjusting everyone it was very much kind of manipulation was the um you know was the goal you know when someone came in with back pain that would be the first line thing that would happen it would be like cool you, you you manipulate them and now it's not now the conversation i'm having with my colleagues is okay brilliant how can we you know what other factors are, are impacting this this patient this patient's pain what other mm -hmm. things can we change what else can we do rather than leaning on our identity as you know spinal manipulation spinal manipulation being our tool and i think there are more and more people doing that now and the rise i think there always has been but the rise of social media has just you know pushed that into the foray kind of more right. more noticeably of, of recent times okay no that's great now we're going to come to some questions thank you for those that are sending them in um I, i've heard from a couple of you that, that some of the twitter co questions aren't posting but thanks to those that have sent them to me directly uh, i will get to those in a second i want to ask the live audience uh, again what do you feel is your take on on chiropractic be that historically as it's emerging now as we've been talking about it as an integrated ms care profession of which you know me and rob and others have been talking about the fact that we we give less and less of a monkeys about that and the, the individual clinician and their competence matters to us more than it does the flavor of certificate on the wall is my usual favorite phrase um now one of the one of the 
questions I had for you is what is are there tensions within chiropractic about the a loss of identity that comes from rhetoric such as what I've just described? Like I've heard yeah. from osteopaths, particularly our mate Ollie Thompson has said that there are some osteopaths that, that want to pull the brakes on that rhetoric and say, no, we're, we're not, we, we are really relevantly distinct from physiotherapists. And also that it's talk like what I've just described is, is actually just a consumption of osteopathy or chiropractic within physiotherapy. Mm. When, when people, if they, if they listen carefully, they know that I'm seen as a physio heretic. It's not as if I'm saying that, uh, that there's, there's not, that, that hasn't got its faults, but w- what's your take on that? And, and how do you personally feel about that? Yeah, I think there's, I think that the difficulty is that often people signed up for these professions, be that chiropractic, osteopathy, because of their biases that they kind of had growing up. That might have been from a family member, that might have been from television, that might have been from, um, uh, you know, that might have been from their chiropractor they saw themselves growing up. So they then entered a profession purely because they saw it as alternative. And then they kind of came up front with this profession that they were taught all this MSK stuff. And then when they were, you know, let loose into the world, they kind of, you know, went in a different direction. I think that chiropractors have had a very hard time, um, you know, from media, from, you know, everything, from policies, everything, you know, they've worked very hard, particularly in America, to kind of stake their stake in the ground to be unique and be special. And, you know, I think they're very hard to give that up and give that kind of identity up. Um, but to me, that's a bit of kind of like a, I don't know what the fallacy is. Is it a, a lost penny fallacy or something like that as well? It's that kind of money spent. And it's these people worked incredibly hard. Sun, and I'm eternally sun, grateful. The sunk cost sunk fallacy. fallacy. Yeah, the, that's the, it. And, chase the, yeah. and it's, uh, and the, you know, these chiropractors worked incredibly hard and we'll be amazingly thankful for the people that did that. You know, like the Chiropractors Act, you know, 90, I think it was 94 or something that, you know, made it a regulated profession before that anyone could call themselves a chiropractor, which, you know, you know we'll, we'll be thankful for. So, you know, I think that they will feel that if we lose that identity, we'll lose a seat at the table and we'll lose that kind of, you know, lose that. What's the word? I can't think of the word I'm looking for. We'll, they'll lose that, you know, specificity. Whereas I kind of see it as, you know, having that foot up and getting that, you know, wider respect within other healthcare professionals will only push it, push everyone further and will push us further into that you know, becoming, you know, spinal MSK experts in their field. Yeah, because that's one of the things that makes it such an important part of of, of, of my wider conversation is because I, I, I'm, as you know, an increasing, increasingly important part of, of our team. Everything goes through a filter whereby we say, will this raise MSK care standards, especially in this country, but of course it bleeds out. And the integration of, of, of more and more MSK voices, podiatry, osteo, chiro, sports therapy, yeah. massage therapists, you know, that, that is for me important because some of the tensions that are, that are sort of, they're, they're, a, they're a paper tiger, you know, they, they're just not nearly as relevant as people sometimes think. Some of the most vocal critics of our policies as MSKR or, or sort of physio matters increasingly blurring those lines, even using words like therapy live rather than physio live or whatever people kind of wanted us to do. Some of them have been patients who've had their fingers burnt in that direction, right? They've been really irritated and frustrated by the fact that some of the most unscrupulous clinicians that they've met happen to have been caros in such a way that that does tarnish uh, that, that word, that profession, and therefore it's something that is beyond reform and beyond reproached for some of them. And so it's patients yeah. that are, and these are patients that are often involved in some of our, our work and are, and are really important voices within the MSKR movement. One of which, of course, in the, in the chat, so thank you Bernadette for tuning in, but Bernadette is someone that I know has had some poor experiences with Caro and, and, and struggles with some of my rhetoric on this. And so I wanna to put to you one of the questions that she's asked on the chat today. Why train as a Caro rather than a physio? So is that directed at me personally or is that directed at what as a whole or both? Well, let's give it both because I'm not sure, but I think it's, a, it's yeah. an interesting so, question. I understand your distinction there. Yeah. So me personally, um, again, no, no special reason, um, only that I looked at all three professions. Um, I looked at chiro, physio and osteo as kind of in my head at the time. The chiropractor I saw was a very MSK, you know, straight line profession, and I couldn't really justify a big difference between them all. Um, my uh, having family working in the NHS, my mum was a nurse, um, spoke to a physio who's one of her colleagues and, and the physio at the time just said, I think this was about 2005. And she just said, 
physios are coming out and can't get jobs. Um, and that's, I don't know whether that was particularly true at the time. I wasn't in the profession. No, it was absolutely. And, no, it was a big and, issue at the time. Yeah. And she just said, train as a chiropractor. She said, you will never be out of work. And I went, okay. And I looked at the chiropractic course and it was on the beach. And I went, cool, that'll do. Um, and that was literally my end. So I had no, every, everyone turned up at college or university with all these magical stories of how they've been cured and stuff. And, you know, their back pain when they were 18. And I, I, I was really gutted. I didn't have anything like that because I just wanted to train. I wanted to help, you know see people every day and I liked having that role um and that's literally the reason I did it um and it led to this you know kind of awesome job I have now and, and what I do um for other people you know a lot of people don't want to work in the NHS um and that's a big part of it as being a physiotherapist you have to have that NHS guidance uh coming out as a chiropractor you you're, you're trained to work in in an autonomous setting from day one um and you know you can graduate and you can do your own thing from day one, you know, you could graduate, not many people do, but you can graduate and go and open up your own practice in your own town and start treating your family and friends, you know, from you know, day one of graduating mm. without having to go into that forced NHS role, which some people would want and obviously some people don't want. Um, so I think that's another reason why a lot of people would do it as well. And then also their, their own perception of chiropractic. Um, you know, they might see themselves as, well, chiropractors are the people that just treat back and neck pain and I love treating back and neck pain and that's kind mm. of the, the way I want to get into. I don't want to go into, you know, they might see physios only doing sports injuries or, you know, some other biases they might have. So they might not want to kind of avoid that. So mm. that's kind of why I sit on it. And then there'll also be the people who come from it from a completely different mindset who have who want, want to be alternative and they want to have that alternative mindset to, you know, the traditional, you know, evidence-based framework. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, there are the, the, the sort of social perception of each of the different professions is certainly relevant. One of the factors I've heard more when I've asked that very question, various different quarters, is that increasingly there's people looking on at the syllabus and thinking that I really do just fancy being an MSK specialist and they are sometimes frustrated and there isn't a persuasive case sometimes made by the prospectuses and the syllabus um, of physiotherapy degrees particularly that then explains to them as to why understanding integrated respiratory neurology, orthopedic and, and, and other and, and sectors within physiotherapy as to why that wouldn't just draw away from their passion project of MSK. Now it's a, yeah. an interesting an interesting balance because we've spoken before about the fact that there's no there's no absence of especially with regards to the safety related variables around things like you know neuro. I mean you have spoken about the fact that of course that doesn't you, you don't get that um, if, if it's not failed to be integrated within your work, but it's just that the conclusion that you're coming to is that it would be that more likely that a chiropractor graduating would be within an MS, it would be an MSK, whereas in physiotherapy, you do a generic degree yeah. of which you then subspecialize if you, if you wish. And, and many of us, myself included, um, were all, it, it was, it, it was a, it was a foregone conclusion that we were gonna go into MSK plus or minus some, some sports stuff and that we were, there's some things that I reflect really positively on, particularly in my pediatric experiences that I had as a physio that I may well have otherwise not had that still inform my work now, independent of the fact that I don't see many children. I mean, that just the learning that I had in that. Um, yeah. But there is also examples from, from my degree training of which I think was waste, you know, admittedly, and, 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 and yeah, non-MSK waste. So I just wondered, that that is a variable for people to consider uh, as well, is that, you know, consumer decisions on this stuff it's, it's more complex than people think and that um your own personal biases and perceptions might not map on to society at large and we kind of know that these are often well subscribed courses and, and and also credible professionals coming out of various different different places we've mentioned him earlier uh, dr ollie thompson uh, is an osteopath by background but also famously uh, professionally um Agnostic. I nearly said professionally ambiguous. No, no I don't think he's ambiguous. He's fairly honest about it. Dave Newell and, uh, and Oliver had described on his on his brilliant words matter podcast about this, and uh, so please do check that out. That's a really good episode. Oh, that one. He's a cracker, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, Dave Newell, I know he's on your on your shortlist for for Therapy Live, isn't he, Rob? So I think yes. if we haven't already. We're yeah. Really reaching out to him. Um, thank you to D Woodcock who posted. I'm a physio working from an osteo practice. One of the osteopaths. Is now retraining as a physio. Her first impression of difference is that in the osteo school, the first year was business planning. In physio, she feels it's more about empowering the patient. Your thoughts on on that, Rob? Um, I, I can't speak to the osteo syllabus. I wasn't aware that they had a business syllabus as part of their training. If Ollie's watching, maybe he might correct me on that. I know that he you know, lectures in the head in there as well. 
that's another misconception that I know we've spoken about before, you know, is that that chiropractic business model, you know, and I can put it out there now to however many, however many people are watching. We had zero business training from as far as I'm aware, you know, we had one lecture from the advertising standard agency, I think, which was an hour and one lecture from a, um, a, an accountant on setting up a legal, um, setting up a, a limited company kind of, I think, the week before we graduated. And that was it. We didn't have any any business training. There was no kind of, you know, advertising and mark I've admit that we did an entire year of marketing rather than ethics before, which is complete nonsense. So no. <laughs> I love so that. yeah, I can't speak to that specifics, but no, yeah. as far as I'm as far as I'm aware that, that they didn't do maybe maybe it was a long time ago and maybe there was, but Yeah, you know, there's something to be there's something to be said, I think, from the seed being planted sometimes in Osteo and Cairo that to some degree you're gonna need to be at least vaguely business savvy or recognize your place within a market economy compared to yeah. Uh, the vast majority moving at least uh, even if it's temporary into into uh, the public sector as a well, you're you're in, you're in an autonomous setting so you, i mean you will have to to an extent and in our in our I, was, I mean my course was five years and the fifth year you're in clinical practice you know morning lectures afternoon kind of patients and mm -hmm. you, you are getting used to you know prescribing a treatment plan knowing that that patient is going to have to pay for that you know it is a student rate and i've forgotten how much it was but it was it was very cheap but knowing so those factors will play into into you know, mm -hmm. as with anyone, when you're recommending a treatment plan to someone, you always, you know, are considering things that, you know, can this patient afford it? You know, those type of things. So they do probably start entering your mind earlier than if you're in, in an NHS setting where you don't have to consider that, I guess. Yeah, I think it, I, I found it um, I found it really interesting when we're considering how people make those sorts of decisions is that you just can't mind read. You've got to, you've got to ask them and you've got to recognise that these things can be can be varied and and, and complex. I think as well the fact that um when people graduate and the, the 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 lack of options that have existed over various different points in time i hadn't really considered that but yeah around the time of, of which we qualified I, I, i'd the sooner i'd have probably traded my physio certificate in for a car or one for a job at that point in time um, and yeah. i can understand why those decisions such as yours could have been preempted and, and a smart one at that um one of the things that's been been mentioned, uh, I don't think I've pulled it up yet, which I should have done, is that Graham Pope, who is was the, I think he's retired recently. Uh, hi, Graham. Thank you for joining. But he's uh, Nottingham University's um, head of department uh, when I was a student. And he said that being involved in the approval process for their courses, he's certainly seen a shift. And then he's followed up with thinking of the course teams regarding patient management. So he's saying that that's been a progressive shift. I think he's agreeing with you there, uh, Rob. And that's from, uh, yeah, a, a leading Head of head of head of, um, brilliant. head of department within a physiotherapy uh, school, and I would also say, of course, a brilliant physiotherapy school. I'm making brilliant. the case of it, even though, admittedly, it uh, spat me. Your own biases there. Um... Well, it's my own biases, and also people are <laughs> just argue they can't be that good to spat you out, really. So I know that sometimes yeah. my reputation corrupts, and so apologies. <laughs> yeah. Brings everyone down, mate. For that, yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, and uh, you know, Graham and, and team just. You know, brilliant for them to it's really reassuring for, for us to hear that of course that um that that they're agreeing that that generally speaking the evidence is is, is shining through uh, regardless of that um oliver thompson has then replied to what you said which is that they don't at his institution or others but of course lecturers setting up clinic accounting etc i think that that's the, the interesting bit isn't it it'd be actually a bit remiss if there wasn't something covered as to the the, the realities of of practice i think the bridging exercise between being a student and being yeah. a clinician is, is we didn't have any of that across the board but you didn't have that, any that of was that. the, that's interesting that was the feedback that we gave when we graduated that you know we had no training in how to do that. i remember asking a tutor do you feel do you feel we should have had more training in how to run a practice and he said yeah of course you know how you expect to run a practice if you're not you know you don't learn so and do you yeah think I, over, I, do you think they overcompensated them because they've been possibly. accused <laughs> they've been accused of it being a business degree not enough <laughs> po possibly yeah possibly yeah maybe maybe <laughs> Um, Bernadette has followed up with working completely outside the NHS surely means that the chiro profession can only self-regulate. Interesting that the FCP initiative excludes chiropractic. What are your thoughts on that? Because in the early pilots, there were chiropractic FCPs, but then it was decided I, that they weren't uh, going to be involved in that. I know two chiropractic FT, FT, FCPs currently, um, so I don't know where that where I that think, comes from this i think it's the in the in the he's roadmap and stuff like that with advanced practice i think it was that osteo fell within it and caro it was going to be that they wanted to, to I, retain more autonomy than that was going to provide the parameters I think the were set too tightly apparently 
for yeah, that? the divide was around. I think the divide was around being registered with the Healthcare Professionals Council, um, which which osteopaths are and chiropractors aren't. Well, um, no, osteos aren't. No, they are. I mean, I, I, an allied health profession now. Oh, sorry, yeah, allied health. I, I think that's what it was. Yeah, sorry, right. my, my mistake. Um, but no, I, I thought that I, I was. I'm, I can't speak to that specifically. Um, I can't see the logic behind it um, in terms of that. You know, you know, I think. You know, Jonathan Field, for example, um, prof I think he's professor or Dr. Jonathan Field now, um, who is a he's an ESP spinal specialist, you know, in the NHS. And he's a chiropractor. Right. You know, he's one of the, the, the few yeah. kind of in, yeah. in that role. Um, but no, as far as where th there are, but I, you know, I think yeah, I can't I think see any yeah. logic behind that. There's another lady that I think we're trying to get in touch with as part of a testimonial series with the MSKR, I think called Hannah Ferris. I think she's a yeah, that's the other one. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, she's brilliant. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I've heard good things. Um, thanks so much for those of you commenting. I'm, I'm afraid we're not going to get to all of them. We're already in overtime, and I definitely want to wrap up in the next two minutes. But Grania, thank you for your comments. She said, interestingly, she connected with a local car who does women's health within her practice, recorded an interesting convo with her that she's going to put out on at your cervix the podcast. It might be relevant to this convo. It certainly will be. And I know from uh, she's not clearly wanting to put any spoilers in there, but Grania uh, told me about that that conversation and that relationship is one that's been really useful, multidisciplinary. You have a multidisciplinary yeah. practice as well, Rob, of which you know you're passionate about the fact that you've got that. Does it does it mm -hmm. especially does, does professional identity within your practice especially matter, or do you guys continually forget and it doesn't matter? No, um, as far as our, our kind of ethos is, is if you come to see us for sciatica or, you know, OA knee, you'll have the same, um, you, you have the same guidance, the same treatment, the same professionalism, whoever you see. Um, and that's mm -hmm. kind of the ethos we, ethos we give to patients. However, patients come with their own perceptions. So people ring up and say, I've got a knee injury, so I should probably see a physio or vice versa. I've got a neck, I've got, I've got neck pain, so I should probably see a chiropractor. And so people come with those bias and then we will then, you know, curtail to those biases. And if someone wishes to see a chiropractor, we're going to put them in to see a chiropractor because, you know, you're immediately going to, you know, have a not very happy patient if she wants to see a chiropractor and you've booked her in to see a physio. Um, despite we know that they're doing the same thing, you know, patients might think they get different or better or worse care either way. So, you know, we do play to those, those biases. Yeah, you don't want to mislead, certainly, do you? But, uh, you know, it's useful if you say, well, there's slightly more of a wait for a, for a physio this week than there is a caro. It, you know, it turns out as soon as you do that, they're not bothered. And then uh, it's something that's really exactly. interesting to observe. I'll finish with this yeah. from, oh, he says, I've, I've just pulled it off by accident there. Stephen Vogel has said, uh, he's an osteopath by background. And thanks for tuning in, Steve. Physiotherapy, chiropractic and osteopathy are not interventions, but professions. The interdisciplinary variability of interventions used may be less than the intra-disciplinary variability. Patients, exactly. not professions yeah. first. I think that's a lovely point to finish on, as much as it had yeah. bloody long words in it that I struggled to spit out. But thank you, Steve, for that uh, really brilliant point and certainly one I agree with and one that I'd love to speak to, to Steve on this very podcast about. I need to get around to get around to doing that for sure. Thank you so much to those of you that have commented as well uh, that we've not been able to get to. I'm, I'm seeing great points here from, from Aileen and from Luke Murray, and I'm sorry we're not going to be able to get to that. Uh, really oh, hi, Luke. Thanks for watching. Luke, Luke calls, um, is this Anto Deck? I can't tell. This is Luke's pet, uh, pet name for uh, Rob and his co-conspirator Dave on the Back Pain podcast, which you should check out if you haven't already. I know it doesn't like have it. the word matters in it, and I know that that is a standard of quality in this industry, but trust me, it's a, it's a cracker. And uh, thanks as ever <laughs> thanks, for your man. time, mate. Really appreciate it. It's been funny to not talk. We usually talk shop on business, don't we? Therapy yeah, business. I know. I know, yes. Yeah, different bents. It's been fun. Thank you, mate. I enjoyed yeah, it. As, uh, absolutely. Just remind people where they can find you on socials. Yeah, you can find me at Rob the Cairo on Twitter or Rob underscore Cairo on Instagram or at the Back Pain Podcast across all, all medias. And I'm working in Sirencester in Gloucestershire. Yeah, send your patients to Dyer Street Clinic in Sirencester. Yeah. You see a variety of MSK professionals, all brilliant. And we don't care. You know, we promise. Go and see. Yeah. <laughs> no one gives the monkeys. It's brilliant. Yeah. All right. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, mate. It. Bye.